Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. There is so much damage that results from what we don't understand. The road of technological advancement is littered with stories of confusion, blunders, hubris, cases of the scientific enterprise learning things the hard way. Some of the most destructive instances of this involve the forces of chemistry sneaking up on us. Just when we thought we understood how a chemical was interacting with the body, we learned we were very wrong. We learned there was more to the story. Thalidomide is one such case of this, a morning sickness drug that for years harbored a horrible secret. The thalidomide catastrophe came down to a simple misunderstanding of data and overlooking just a subtlety of molecular structure. I've talked way too much on this podcast about the structure of molecules, how the arrangement of atoms drives chemical behavior, and even slight changes in the way everything is put together can result in huge differences in the behavior of a chemical or material. Well, I'm going to take it even one step further. It's possible for two chemicals to be mirror images of one another, same chemical formula, but very, very different in the way they behave. A molecule can have an evil twin, a reflection in the mirror that may look the same, but doesn't act that way. Think of Michael and Garth Knight if you're old enough to remember the 80s Knight Rider show. The mirror reflection phenomenon is known as chirality. This property of asymmetry is extremely important in several branches of math and science. The word chirality is derived from the Greek word care, meaning hand. Human hands are perhaps the most universally recognized example of chirality. The left and right hands are the same structure in a way. However, the left hand is a non-superimposable mirror image of the right hand. No matter how the two hands are oriented, it's impossible for all the major features of both hands to perfectly align. This difference in symmetry becomes obvious if someone attempts to shake the right hand of a person using their left hand, or if a left-handed glove is placed on a right hand. An object or a system is chiral if it is distinguishable or different somehow from its mirror image. That is, it cannot be superimposed onto it. Conversely, a mirror image of an achiral object, such as a sphere, cannot be distinguished from the object. A chiral object and its mirror image are called enantiomorphs, from the Greek word meaning opposite forms. A chiral object and its mirror image are called enantiomorphs, from the Greek word meaning opposite forms. When referring to molecules, they're referred to as enantiomers. Thalidomide is a drug with this property. One enantiomer of thalidomide can help with insomnia and morning sickness, but its evil twin will bring horrible birth defects. The two enantiomers of thalidomide, the rectus, or right hand R version of thalidomide, and the left, the S version. And the S, in this case, stands for sinister, or Latin for left. In 1952, thalidomide was first synthesized by chemical industry Bissell, but the compound and recipe were discarded because the researchers found the drug to have no effect on animals. Oops. At first, the scientists thought this drug did literally nothing, and they basically forgot about it. In 1957, the patent to thalidomide was acquired by Chemi Grunenthal in Germany. The German company had been searching and scouring available patents to find potentially valuable orphan drugs to serve a growing market for antibiotics. Thalidomide nearly went unnoticed again, but before it was overlooked a second time, one of the pharmacologists on the project noticed that the R structure, the right hand form, was similar to another drug, a known sedative. The German team uncovered this property in thalidomide. The researchers at Chemi Grunenthal also found that thalidomide was a particularly effective anti-nausea drug that had an inhibitory effect on morning sickness. The toxicity was examined in several animals. However, these experiments focused on just one hand of the drug. They were only testing the right-hand version of thalidomide. 
they had forgotten about the S enantiomer, the sinister thalidomide. The drug was also never tested on pregnant women. The German medicinal chemists worked to refine and improve the lead compound into a profitable drug. They developed a chemical process for large-scale manufacturing that was a bit different than the method used in research and development. The new process produced a mix of left and right thalidomide, or what's called a racemate. The company began marketing it under the trade name Contragen. It was proclaimed a wonder drug for insomnia, coughs, colds, and headaches. In Germany during that period, the use of medications during pregnancy was not strictly controlled, and the drugs weren't always tested thoroughly for potential harm to the fetus. Thousands of pregnant women took the drug to relieve their symptoms. At the time of thalidomide's development, scientists did not believe any drug taken by a pregnant woman could pass the placental barrier and harm the developing fetus. This tragedy was helped along by incorrect assumptions that had become medical dogma. In Germany, reports of abnormalities in children born to mothers who were using thalidomide started to appear. In late 1959, doctors noticed peripheral neuritis developing in patients who took the drug over a long period of time. It was only after this point that thalidomide ceased to be available over the counter. At the same time, in the UK, the British pharmaceutical company, the Distillers Company, marketed thalidomide throughout the UK, Australia, and New Zealand under the brand name Distival as a remedy for morning sickness. Their advertisement claimed outright that Distival can be given with complete safety to pregnant women and nursing mothers without any adverse effect on mother or child. The company seemed fairly sure of themselves that thalidomide was safe for expecting mothers. They were the authorities. The British advertisement read, outstandingly safe distival has been prescribed for years in this country. Globally, more pharmaceutical companies started to produce and market the drug under the license from Kemi Grunenthal. The story of what happened with thalidomide in the United States is very interesting. The American pharmaceutical distributor and manufacturer, Richardson Merrill, applied for its FDA approval in September of 1960. Just as the drug was being tested for use in the US, the first reports from Europe regarding birth defects from thalidomide were popping up. However, these accounts hadn't reached critical mass, and thalidomide was still considered perfectly safe. That same year, in 1960, Frances Oldham Kelsey was hired by the FDA in Washington, D.C. At that time, she was only one of seven full-time physicians reviewing all new drugs in the U.S. For the FDA, one of her first assignments was to review an application by Richardson Merrill for the drug thalidomide. Even though it had already been approved in Canada and more than 20 European and African countries, she withheld approval for the drug and requested further studies. Despite pressure from thalidomide's manufacturer, Kelsey persisted in requesting additional information to explain the English study that documented peripheral neuritis. She also requested data showing the drug was not harmful to a growing fetus. Richardson Merrill was called on to perform tests and report results. The company demanded FDA approval six times and was refused each time. While the fight with the FDA was going on, a total of 17 children with thalidomide-induced malformations were born in the U.S. from just the limited testing alone. Kelsey's insistence that the drug be fully tested prior to approval was vindicated when the births of deformed infants across Europe were eventually linked to thalidomide ingestion by their mothers during pregnancy. Kelsey had stopped what would have been a massive disaster. She was given a presidential award for distinguished service from the federal government for not allowing thalidomide to be approved for sale in the U.S. She withstood massive corporate pressure to stop this drug from poisoning unborn children. Researchers discovered their held belief in biology was wrong and that thalidomide could indeed cross the placental barrier and cause serious birth defects. The case showed how chemical chirality is critical 
how nearly identical forms of the same drug could have completely divergent effects. Pharmacologists had to be much more careful in their drug design, and synthetic medicinal chemists had to watch out for evil and antiomers. The birth defects caused by thalidomide led to the development of greater drug regulation and monitoring in many countries. Francis Oldham Kelsey was hailed on the front page of the Washington Post as a heroine for averting a large-scale tragedy in the U.S. Morton Mintz, author of that Washington Post article, said, Kelsey prevented the births of thousands of armless and legless children. Kelsey insisted that her assistants, Oyama Hiro and Lee Geismar, as well as her FDA superiors who backed her strong stance, received credit as well. Frances Kelsey, one for the Vanadium Wall of Heroes, she even gives credit to her team. In the late 1950s and early 60s, more than 10,000 children in 46 countries were born with deformities. The severity and location of the deformities depended on how many days into the pregnancy the mother was before exposure to thalidomide. It was if taken on the 20th day of pregnancy, it caused central brain damage. Day 21 would damage the eyes. Day 22, the ears and face. Day 24, the arms. And leg damage would occur if taken up to day 28. Thalidomide did not damage the fetus if it was taken after 42 days of gestation. If thalidomide is such a great drug in the R or right-hand form, and only the left-handed sinister version is dangerous, a seemingly obvious answer to the problem would be to make only the R an antiomer of thalidomide. That way, one can get rid of morning sickness altogether and avoid all the toxic effects of its sinister enantiomer. However, in the body, the problem becomes complicated. The human liver contains an enzyme that can actually turn R thalidomide to S thalidomide. So even the administration of pure R thalidomide results in a mixture of enantiomers. This means that the S form will be present in the body to some degree, whether or not it was originally taken. Even if you don't ingest the sinister form, it can still sneak up and cause toxic effects. Thalidomide was banned, and physicians were told to destroy all their supplies. However, that isn't where the story ends. The relationship between drugs and humans is complicated. In 1964, one doctor in Israel was treating leprosy and saw some potential with thalidomide. He didn't care about the ban. Dr. Jacob Sheshkin administered thalidomide to a patient critically ill with leprosy despite the moratorium on its use. The results were positive. His patient, who had been in excruciating pain, was able to sleep for hours and was able to get out of bed without help after waking. A successful clinical trial studying the use of thalidomide in leprosy soon followed. If properly understood and administered carefully, thalidomide is actually a miracle drug, useful against an array of formidable diseases. Today it's used to treat several types of cancers, graft versus host disease, and a number of painful skin conditions, including complications from leprosy. It took humankind years to realize what thalidomide was doing under everyone's noses. Doctors thought drugs couldn't cross the placental barrier. Chemists didn't understand the power of sinister enantiomers. There was overzealous marketing in the boom of the age of better living through chemistry. It all came together into quite a tragedy. On the other hand, the story of thalidomide is also about the heroism of Francis Kelsey, about gaining a deeper understanding of chiral molecules and cellular receptors, about some of the deadly subtleties of drug chemistry. This story also shows how, even considering the horrible and unavoidable risks of thalidomide, it's still an important and useful drug in the pharmacopoeia. Nature rarely paints things in black and white, and rarely makes things simple for us. Is thalidomide poison, or is it medicine? It's both. Thank you very much. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium. <laughs>